Uh, John Rather, Dr. Rather, uh, got his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from UTK and his UT Knoxville, and his PhD in Astronomy from the University of California at Berkeley. I had the privilege of having breakfast with John this morning, and, I, and John uh, worked at NASA headquarters for several years when I was up there a few times. I didn't really live up there, but I felt like it sometimes. Found out also that he has worked at three different national laboratories, has been the vice president of an aerospace company, uh, was in the senior executive service, and uh, when he was at NASA, he was the assistant director for technology development for NASA. And so I'll turn it over to John to tell us what uh, to expect and how to make this all happen. So, John. Thank you, sir. <laughs> all right. Um, the uh, name of this talk is How Ultra Lightweight Probes Can Catalyze Major Interstellar Progress. We'll get to that. What I'm really trying to do is to propose new steps at the front end that can catalyze things and how do we get there from here and how do we do something real within our lifetimes. Now since I'll be 77 in January, you're going to have to hurry and so uh, I hope you'll uh, take it seriously. Um, let me see, I've got a thing here. I, I thought I'd start with a little personal history. Um, these are my three kids on uh, July, uh, I should say July 15th, 1969, the day before the launch of Apollo 11. We dropped everything at Berkeley and uh, flew to uh, Florida and we were there to see it go and um, it's still treasured by all three of them. That's Rick there in the middle. Um, a little bit later on after I finished my doctorate, uh, I got to know Robert Heinlein very well. Robert uh, was the reason, I guess, that I'm here now because when I was 11 years old, I, got, I said I've got to go to the stars and uh, it was because, largely because of his books. After I was in Berkeley, uh, I found out that he lived nearby and uh, he, his house was painted yellow inside. It makes it difficult for the pictures, but, but uh, this is Robert and his wife, Jenny, in the green. And there's Rick uh, at the bottom, who was 11 years old then. So he was then the same age I was in the previous generation when I got interested in all of this. And you see Robert's Hugo's and stuff on the shelves there next to it. Um, shortly after that, Rick, who was an avid reader, had just read this book, which I think came out just about 40 years ago right now. And he pointed to the uh, fine print at the, at the bottom of the page which, um, right here, which uh, says possibly the finest science fiction novel I've ever read, signed Robert Heinlein. And um, he said, uh, can this really be? Because I thought he wrote the finest um, science fiction. And, and this uh, led to uh, my thinking that I had to justify some of the things about laser light sales as proposed in this book. At that time, I was working with JPL on various things, Jet Propulsion Lab. And uh, so I got this little contract, uh, which it has the purchase order number there in the middle, laser-driven light sails and examination of possibilities for interstellar probes and other missions. And I have to say that this was, as far as I know, the first really uh, digging deep type uh, study of the physics and engineering of light sails. And it has uh, a lot of important stuff still in it. Now, the front page there of studies in uh, uh, 38 years ago where it was created by a machine, uh, an antique machine that some of you have heard of. It was called a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> it looks uh, a little bit quaint, but the content is pretty good. And there are a couple of things in there that deserve looking at still. Namely, uh, I realized that as the, sh as the light sail propagates through the interstellar medium, 10 hydrogen atoms per cc, they are going to penetrate through the thin foil of the sail and that will ionize all of the hydrogen that it sweeps out. And this is very important. If the light sail is being stretched by a magnetic ring, superconducting ring around it, the dipole field will divert the ions as they come through away from the payload. And so you get rid of the problem of subjecting your payload to an enormous flux of particles as you sweep out this very, very long and thin uh, cylinder between here and where you're going. Uh, the uh, next thing that happened was that people at JPL knew Robert Ford and that he was thinking along the same lines and they sent me over to uh, 
get to know him, and we indeed liked each other very much. And uh, I may have been the first person that said, hey, we believe in light sales, but how do you make them stop when you get there? And then we realized that uh, the, this same phenomenon of sweeping through the interstellar medium, if you time the acceleration right, then let go of it and let the retarding force of the particles that it encounters the rest of the way slow you down all the way, then you can arrive where you want to go without going through at uh, three-tenths of the speed of light. Uh, this has been shown several times during this meeting, uh, Ford's concept, uh, where he has uh, lasers orbiting around the planet Mercury, a thousand of them, each of them at 100 terawatts, which is a pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, strong uh, faith in the future of, of solar-powered lasers. But um, I uh, started thinking about other options, and uh, I guess this was the first time I'd really started thinking about von Neumann machines. I suppose all of you know that John von Neumann, about 70 years ago, famous uh, Hungarian physicist at Princeton, uh, suggested that ma machines could replicate themselves in open-ended fashion. And so self-replicating machines are generally referred to that way. The idea was to uh, start them working on the surface of mercury and uh, to uh, make light-emitting laser diodes over the whole surface, make it into a coherent array, and that they have <coughs> sensors there that enable you to phase everything up. So that, that would uh, gain another uh, uh, factor of 10 or more on Bob Ford's orbiting uh, lasers. Uh, we could get close to 10 to the 15th watts this way into the laser power. But uh, in the fullness of time, another decade or so, I'd started backing off from light sails and thinking about a lot of other things. In 1991, I uh, published this paper in JBIS, uh, Lasers Revisited Their Superior Utility for Interstellar Beacons, Communication, and Travels. And uh, it has a lot of interesting stuff in it. Uh, but one of the most significant things is this plot that shows uh, the distance in light years across the bottom and the laser power that's required to communicate across those long distances and provide a signal to noise of 100 to 1 at the receiving end. Now what I did was just assume that the spot size was a little bit bigger than the, the life zone around uh, whatever star you're looking at. In this case, the spot would be about 3 AU across, but even so, if you focus the laser light at a, at a range of uh, 100 light years, you still need very small optics under 100 meters in order to deliver that kind of signal to noise. And so I said, hey, it, it really is pretty easy to get a lot of information. The reason we have the fiber optic uh, high-speed internet now is because of the extreme bandwidth you get from lasers. And um, so I suggested this is enough so we could actually transmit not just the human genome, but the recipe for the uh, factory that the genome needs in order to reproduce itself. And um, that got some attention too from uh, <coughs> Omni Magazine, which existed back then. They did this article uh, about the concept called laser clones. And uh, I uh, am sure that others had thought about uh, this and probably written about it extensively before, but you know how it is uh, innovating as I went along. <coughs> um, now, I'm going to shift gears and try to talk about how to get there. Uh, <clears throat> hierarchy synergy is very, very powerful. And what I mean by that is that tiny von Neumann machines can beget giant projects. John Mankin showed this morning one way of doing it where you have little machines like ants that you can stack together and many other ways to build things. A second way is to go from micro to macro and you would plant the lightest weight, smallest thing that you could, say on an asteroid or on a lunar surface or maybe on a planetary surface, and it would start to replicate not its own size, but the next bigger thing, which does the next bigger thing after that, and gets more and more complexity as you go along. And so um, I propose that we should develop them initially to 
colonize our solar system and then evolve those technologies for interstellar transfer. And I use transfer meaning not necessarily human travel, but whatever. And uh, <clears throat> the, you do need to think immediately about some first generation macro projects that are needed to kickstart the, pro the process. And I believe that the uh, key to this is uh, asteroid capture of very small asteroids. So I chaired for the U.S. Congress while I was at NASA the first study of the NEO threat and what to do about it. We convened it at Los Alamos in 1992 and uh, we went quite far in that session uh, figuring out what, how to capture them and what to do with them. Uh, it turns out that 10 meter diameter asteroids probably pass through a sphere the size of the moon's orbit about once a day on the average, maybe more, and uh, 20 meter ones uh, at least once a month. Uh, there's a Gaussian distribution of relative velocities and the slow ones uh, uh, that are approximately co-traveling with the Earth uh, are the ones that you want to look at for capture. So the idea is what can we do to uh, rendezvous with an incoming uh, small asteroid and capture it into the L4, L5 regions where we can then <coughs> industrialize it with the hierarchical uh, von Neumann <coughs> machines. Uh, the uh, next step after that would be to implement the results of that for human travel and development, including developing safe lunar colonies and uh, traveling out to uh, Mars and Jupiter. The uh, implementing technologies to do that start with <coughs> things that are very much uh, within the state of the art and coming on strong right now namely MEMS devices, microelectromechanical systems, and three-dimensional printers. And so you need to demonstrate tiny first-generation devices that progressively build larger subsequent machines, both individually and collectively. And I argue, I should have made that yellow, I guess, that uh, start, we, we should start parallel development projects now with modest public and private funding to demonstrate uh, important academic scale components uh, to get this thing launched, get the project launched. Uh, at the same time, we have to develop macro um, transformative technologies, and there are several of these that are also very much approaching the state of the art. A lot's been said already about high energy lasers fascinating that the way that's really come down after 50 years of flapping around is that uh, fiber optic lasers with uh, driven by LEDs are the most scalable, cheapest, and fastest way to get to really high powers. And uh, high temperature superconductors, I mentioned Jim Powell's role in this thinking, but uh, they are, are also ready for industrialization. They enable super powerful magnets and machines that are nearly 100% efficient. Uh, they also enable, and this is very critical to what I'm going to say next, magnetically deployed huge space structures, ultra lightweight structures. You don't have to rotate things to make them spread out. There's a really nifty thing you can do instead. And I want to mention electromagnetic launch and the star tram system, which is the way to cut the cost of getting from the ground to space from the present uh, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars per kilogram per pound. I'm sorry, from uh, the Earth with rockets to electromagnetic launch from the ground. Jim has recently written a really interesting book, and it should be uh, required reading for everybody. It's called Star Tram: The New Race to Space. And it includes not only the justifications for all the electromagnetic propulsion, but a lot of very deep and penetrating consideration of some of the other options. And the, the uh, uh, discussions there are quite valuable. Um, the, we were deeply involved in lasers for a long, long time. And uh, after the end of the Cold War, we looked at uh, how to convert them for uh, civilian space. And uh, I won't dwell on this for long at all, but it is a way of putting down a lot more than a solar constant on an array of laser photovoltaic cells with very high efficiency, 50-60% conversion efficiency, 
that enables fast uh, electric propulsion from low Earth orbit to the moon and out to the rest of the solar system. Also, it solves the problem of the lunar night because uh, if you have four of these facilities uh, equally spaced around the Earth as the Earth rotates, they can always transmit a laser beam to a, to a beacon here and you see the spot about 100 meters in diameter that's populated by these laser photovoltaic cells that the astronaut is showing you. This gives you plenty of power, a megawatt or so, to run your bulldozer and to uh, run a separation plant to get hydrogen and oxygen. Of course, that can fuel this uh, uh, shuttlecraft here to rendezvous with the thing, the other thing uh, here coming in from, from the Earth with the payloads. And so it, uh, that one ability to transmit substantial power to a small collector is really a, a major implementing uh, uh, source. As far as the ground to space things discussed in StarTram, the earliest and simplest thing you can do is build this. It'll fit inside the White Sands uh, missile range. There's a 12,000 foot peak in the middle of it. And uh, you can launch that thing at, a, at about uh, Mach uh, 8 or 10 and uh, it's, uh, it passes through the atmosphere in less than 10 seconds and into space. Now, to build it would, would cost about two years of NASA's budget uh, on the order of uh, a few billion dollars. The, the launch tube is about 100 kilometers long and um, it is strictly uh, an electromagnetic accelerator. As it comes out, you get a big sonic boom and it uh, goes straight uh, into space, but the, uh, the uh, uh, deceleration is very small and you're in space in 10, 10 seconds. Now, I, I say you, I don't mean that. It's a 30G launch <laughs> and it, it cuts the cost of launching uh, hundreds of kilograms, thousands of kilograms into space from on the order of um, 10 to $20,000 per kilogram down, down to about $100 per kilogram. So once you've got it, it opens space for large-scale development. You can get a lot of stuff there in a hurry. And it has defense applications, which is why ARPA has already, already expressed interest in it. Um, the um, uh, next thing I want to talk about is uh, solar, uh, four solar concentrators and light sails and telescopes. <coughs> The concept that uh, we named MIC, which means magnetically inflated cable, large rigid, rigid structures. The uh, proof of principle experiment was done by Ampere and Maxwell in about 1835. You flow current down one wire and back up the other. The fields, the magnetic fields, oppose each other, and so they, they, the wires bulge apart and form themselves into a circle. Well, if you do this with um, superconductors, with uh, super insulation shields around them, which are easy to do. By the way, we can do these in the vacuum chambers that NASA has in various facilities here to show that it works, and we can do it in a hurry. We could do this in a year or two. Um, what it enables uh, is a way of stretching. It, it creates tensile structures, tension structures with carbon filaments running across and the circulating currents in these boxes. This is a kilometer in diameter optical surface and uh, down here is the Hubble and the James Webb and the Keck and the Magellan 25 meter telescope for comparison. Uh, so this is a way of making really huge uh, optical surfaces and uh, uh, Sandy and others can tell you how to turn that into an optical telescope. Uh, which I won't get into right now. Um, the um, e much easier thing than an optical surface is just a light bucket, a, a solar concentrator. And uh, this one is 100 meters in diameter. And it's putting uh, uh, about uh, an enough solar radiation on the uh, focus here to run a rocket. It's, it goes up to about 3,000 degrees Kelvin and uh, you introduce a propellant like hydrogen and, and off you go. Now this is the greatest way to run, rendezvous with these incoming small asteroids and when you've done it you can move the engine out of the way and use this 
concentrator to turn the asteroid itself into a rocket. In other words, you start evaporating away the surface of the asteroid, it jet, the material jets off and uh, propels the asteroid where you want it to go. And so we've looked at that in uh, quite a bit of detail in this paper, MIC, large-scale magnetically infl inflated cable structures for space power propulsion, communication, and observational uh, applications. And uh, what uh, you find is that uh, capturing these 10 meter diameter near Earth asteroids or NEOs or NEAs can transform space development in a decade. It's, it's easy to do. This is a photograph of the surface of Eros uh, 10 years ago uh, from about one kilometer away. And we know now that uh, a large majority of the asteroids that come near the Earth are just rubble piles. They're loosely aggregated. And so it's very easy to uh, visualize heating them and vaporizing the surface. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, we could use moon dust, but why go to the trouble of lifting dust from the moon and re-aggregating it when you've got uh, these nice ready-made asteroids coming in and you can use them? Uh, it can immediately solve the problem of ionizing radiation for humans in space because two feet of, of asteroid dust surrounding the human uh, transport chamber provides just as much or more insulation from, from solar flares and cosmic rays as does the Earth's atmosphere. So it, if you lifted all that mass from the Earth, it would be very expensive and difficult to do. But if you capture it uh, from capturing an asteroid, then it's easy. So we have um, the ability to get lots of useful materials with all the minerals and so on associated, the radiation shielding. And then we can get free rides uh, from low Earth orbit to the Moon and to Mars. What we mean there is that uh, the von Neumann machines hollow out the asteroid, inflate a nice habitat inside it, and we put, put it into a figure eight orbit around the Moon and the Earth so that it passes to low Earth orbit where it can rendezvous with people coming up, and uh, it provides the shielding through the Van Allen belts and shielding against solar flares and so on to get you to the moon. You can do the same thing between the Earth and Mars because there are a lot of these millions, literally, of these small asteroids, that some of which osculate both the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of Mars. So you hollow, get and snag a few good ones, let the von Neumann machines uh, tidy them up for you, and you uh, ride comfortably inside uh, uh, between the two planets and uh, disembark when you get there. Um, did, did I leave out one thing at the bottom? Uh, oh yeah, the, the question of angular momentum and pseudo-gravity, uh, you can uh, capture two of these small <laughs> asteroids that you make into habitats and put a, put a cable between them, say a kilometer long. There won't be very <coughs> much tension in the cable and, and the uh, centrifugal force will be adequate to give you uh, comfortable gravity all the way. Uh, this I won't get into right now because of time, but, but a 100 meter diameter concentrator can put 10 to the 12th joules per day uh, on the focus at about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And that's a lot of energy and you can do a lot with it. This uh, table from the paper is looking at uh, different uh, relative velocities uh, that are, are required to capture the asteroid one kilometer per second, three or five. And what you find using the, the uh, system that I've described is that that means you can capture uh, the real uh, slow ones in about five days and the five kilometer per second ones in about uh, two weeks, 15 days. And uh, these numbers uh, are based on the known properties of the mass you're evaporating and, and the uh, ISP that you'll generate. Uh, all of that is discussed uh, in this paper here, New Technologies and Strategies to Exploit Near-Earth Asteroids for Breakthrough Space Development. All right, now let's look at interstellar. That's why we're here, I guess. Uh, the stored energy to accelerate one kilogram to three percent of the speed of light 
is 10 to the 14th joules, and that's 100,000 gigawatt seconds. If you think in terms of some sort of uh, linear accelerator, uh, one shot uh, way of getting there, you know already how difficult it is. The uh, total generating power capacity of the United States is 1,100 gigawatts at present. So it could launch 2.2 pounds, one kilogram, in 100 seconds if everything else were stopped. And um, so that's, that's an interesting <coughs> number anyway. But what's much better is what John Mankins talked about at length this morning, the star slinger. And uh, that uh, idea has been uh, maturing for the last few years uh, by John and Jim Powell and others. And uh, the point is that if we capture asteroids and put them in orbit around the Earth, say at 50,000 uh, kilometers from the Earth, then we can spin out a superconducting cable that goes all the way around the Earth, and it can be over the poles that is better because then you can shoot at anything. And you, instead of, it's the same thing if you think of an automobile track, if you want to go from zero to 200 miles an hour uh, in one lap, you uh, need 500 or 1,000 horsepower. Whereas uh, if you don't care how many days it takes you to get there, you can do it with one horsepower and get the speed up. Well, it, it has to be a big radius. I looked originally at doing it around the moon, just building it all the way around the moon. But uh, the centrifugal force is still tremendous at that shorter radius. And so you want it to be pretty far out from the Earth so that uh, you don't have to deal with that material problem. But this really is a justifiable uh, thing, and John made a very good case for it this morning. Uh, so uh, a 100 meter diameter solar <coughs> concentrator in space could provide 10 to the 12th joules per day at the focus. And so this system would require something like 300 days with 50% efficiency to uh, launch lightweight probes to the stars to 3% uh, of the speed of light. Uh, at 3%, now remember I mentioned decelerating by, we launch it here and then it sweeps out the interstellar medium, the, the hydrogen between the stars to slow it down as it gets there. And at 3% of light speed, it's going to take about 160 years to get there. If you increase it to 10%, you'll need you know, 10 times more of everything. Uh, the current state of the art uh, device in the world is probably the Large Hadron Collider. It has 27 kilometers of these superconducting magnets wrapped around a ring on the uh, Swiss-French border and uh, it was used to discover the Higgs particle. Um, the, most of what you see here is vacuum equipment. The, the, the coils themselves are blue and so you can think uh, in terms in space you don't need any of that and uh, you can make the coil smaller and so on. So, so the roles of superconductivity in space, there are many of them. I wish I could talk for a long time about them, but, but uh, we started out looking at superconducting acceleration and then we realized that the better way to do it is with the sling ring that uh, John described. Um, and this is saying the same thing. A straight accelerator, 300,000 kilometers long, would require enormous stored energy. Don't go there. A, a single superconducting star sling, uh, 50,000 kilo, kilometers in radius from the Earth or Moon, can launch 30 <coughs> kilograms by accelerating gradually for 300 days. Um, it's adequate for a one kilogram hierarchical von Neumann payload and a 10 kilogram deceleration membrane. So we're talking about small payloads and relatively small, what we would call light sails, but sails that provide enough resistance so that you're slowing everything down. I see time is up. Yes. Um, um, and the timing is good because what I want to launch with this thing is not only the, uh, von Neum the hierarchical von Neumann machines to build a habitat there, but I want uh, to also include a lot of these stored, the most wonderful von Neumann machines in the known universe. Every woman makes quite a few of these uh, during her lifetime, and the men provide this uh, clutter that's on, on the surface. But th th this thing is, uh, it's uh, a, a four-tenths of a micron, I'm sorry, four-tenths of a millimeter 
Can't get it right, John. Where are you? Right here. Yeah, say it for me. Four tenths of a millimeter in diameter. Uh, yes, right. Uh, 400 microns. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, it can. It's uh, atomic weight. Uh, it has on the order of 10 to the 30th atoms in it. It has millions and billions of, of submachines and organelles in it. And uh, in nine months, it can reproduce a human being, which grows up to a level and then creates von Neumann machines. So, uh, <laughs> so if, if we uh, if we uh, think in terms of uh, uh, launching to a nearby star, having putting in place a, an electronic nanny to raise the, the colonists, and then mature them there, more <coughs> male and female, and then we're off and running. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Try to always make time for one question, at, at, at least, if there is one, uh, even though we ran a little bit long. No? All right. <laughs>